Okay. Um, so um, thanks for uh, for coming to this presentation. Um, I'm very much aware that this is the third day, and that this is probably your third or fourth session of it. So um, everybody's a little bit exhausted. I know I am. So I hope you can bear with me. Um, I will uh, talk about um, uh, most of it about organizing your your CSS, your style sheets, into some into something that becomes more manageable um, and and more maintainable uh, than you might be writing uh, style sheets like uh, right now, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, preprocessors, um, and we will talk a little bit about a specific naming convention called BAM, uh, which you might find very interesti interesting. I know I did. Um, I am, uh, my name is Babs. Uh, most people cannot pronounce my, my surname, uh, including Dutch people, so don't worry about that. Um, I am both a front-end developer as well as a back-end developer. Um, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, I spend about 55% of my time doing uh, front-ends and the rest of it uh, uh, doing uh, uh, PHP programming, uh, most of which for Joomla, obviously. Um, yeah, CSS. In itself, CSS is a very simple language. Uh, anybody that speaks English can basically write it. Um, which in itself, th that's, that's the, the, the difficult bit right there, because, because it's so simple, um, it doesn't really give us any tools to organize and structure it well, um, uh, which ends up in, I'm sure everybody's been there once, uh, huge style sheets that become difficult to load, in some cases even impossible to load, because some versions of Explorer uh, uh, cannot load beyond a certain amount of lines, and so your whole website will fail to render. Um, but uh, with the introduction of preprocessors um, and the introduction of CSS3, I might add, it's become more of the sheets that Facebook was don't have to explain how this is from the, the size of Facebook But this is um, how many know it? Five lines of CSS for the CSS or for the Facebook style sheets. So pretty good win. Um, she then um, baptized that methodology that that she developed through Facebook uh, and called it uh, object-oriented CSS. Uh, 
Um, so what are the main things? Um, she separates the structure from the skin, meaning that, uh, to give a practical example, um, your, your grid would be the structure of your page. Uh, th that would be um, uh, uh, defined in a different place than, um, uh, say, the, the, the aesthetics of your site, your, your theme or your template. Um, and she separates the container and the content, and this is about context mostly, um, but we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, the end result of this is that you get modular, so reusable code. Because your code is reusable, your code becomes dry because you, you, you define a few blocks and then you reuse them and reuse them and reuse them. So you don't have as, many co as much code in there. Um, and that very much makes your CSS scalable and maintainable. So, good thing. Um, there are other um, systems besides uh, OOCSS uh, uh, by Nicole. Um, there's Smax, actually Smax, um, this, this little guy is, is, is from the Smax cover. Um, that was uh, my first encounter with, uh, with object-oriented CSS, or the whole thinking behind it anyway. Um, it's, it's a little book, really tiny book, um, and I can highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's fun to read and, and it will give you a lot of insight into what this topic actually is. Um, then there's BAM, we'll get to that, and then there's Atomic CSS, and I'm sure there's more. But these are the four main ones that if you're interested in the subject, you can look into. Um, so less CSS, it's great, but it's more work. <laughs> Too bad, right? <laughs> you're all thinking you could, no, it's more work. But it's less maintenance, and it's faster loads. And, and uh, our clients, our users, they, they like faster loads. So, um, this is actually a scan from a, from a little napkin drawing uh, made by Harry Roberts, uh, aka CSS Wizardry, uh, who is a, a young chap from, uh, from the UK, a front-end developer. He was de developing for, for large uh, websites. And um, he discovered the 80-20 rule. And basically what it means is um, he writes 80% of his CSS during the first 20% of the website or of the markup of the website or the entire code base of the website. So um, already that's an indication that yes, it's more work to write modular CSS, but especially in larger websites, that will pay off because at some point you'll just be adding markup um, and you'll be adding functionality and pages, but you won't be adding any CSS anymore, which is a really good thing. Um, so that's his 80-20 rule. I didn't come up with that. Uh, Harry Roberts, CSS Wizardry, is also a great resource to follow. Um, oh, by the way, even though this is the case, I still use the whole modular approach, approach even for smaller websites. Um, not only because you never know uh, how your website will grow over time, but also because it's just a way of, of organizing yourself and organizing your style sheets. So it, it, it sort of becomes a, a habit. Um, okay. Um, so what do we have right now that can help us to organize the CSS code? Um, <coughs> there's not a whole of a lot. CSS doesn't doesn't give us uh, a, a lot of stuff uh, to help us, except for some some common sense methods, really. Um, um, you you can structure your style sheets if you wouldn't use a preprocessor. You could just uh, um, um, make sure that the, or the, the, the order in which you declare your properties uh, is, is one that's, that's easily understandable and that makes sense to you. Um, I remember when we didn't use preprocessors that we, we put these huge uh, uh, index files in the beginning of our style sheets uh, so that uh, uh, new developers could read what was going to be in them later on, but still, they were, they were big. Um, then ordering, not only the ordering of your uh, styles, sh your, your decla declarations, but also the ordering of the, the properties within those, those declarations uh, can help you um, uh, give more structure and meaning to your, um, uh, to, your webs to your style sheets. Commenting, very important other uh, method you can use to, to make life easier for yourself and for other developers that may come on to the project later on. Um, and then semantics, and that's a bit of an interesting one. By semantics, I mean semantics for the developers. 
not for the machines, because the machines don't care about the semantics. They care about the semantics of your HTML, but they do not care about the semantics of your, of your class modes. Um, so semantics for us, so that it's easy for us to understand what a certain class does to your markup. Um, example, button. Okay, everybody understands what button will do to your markup. Um, so you have these methods, and then there's a couple of habits uh, um, uh, that, that, that are probably good to have. Again, all of this in order to be able to, to organize your CSS so that it becomes more maintainable, but still using just regular old CSS. Um, Separating skin and behavior. This is tying into what uh, to what Nicole uh, said earlier, where where she uh, uh, she she separates the structure from the skin. Uh, so um, uh, avoid repetition, very important <coughs> one. Um, use shallow selectors. Does that make sense? If everybody know what shallow selectors are? Okay. There's, there's a little bit on, on, on uh, specificity that has to do with this, but shallow selectors basically are single word selectors. Um, uh, and not, uh, okay, uh, a good example in Joomla for a not shallow selector would be anything to do with the main menu. Uh, because we usually have a class on the top level of your menu, of on, on the UL. Uh, probably also a class on the module that contains the navigation elements. So you'll have uh, like a dot module, and then you'll have a dot main nav. Is it main nav? Yeah, yeah. And then dot item, and then dot a, uh, then a or or uh, li or something like that. So a whole lot of uh, 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 string the long classes uh, to identify a specific ob object in your DOM that you can then style. That is not a shallow selector. A shallow selector is just one thing, item ID. That's a shallow selector, just one thing. Um, and we do that because browsers render everything from right to left. So the more uh, classes you have uh, strung along, so the, the least shallow your selectors are, the longer it will take for the browser to determine whether or not it should do something with that L that's inside an item ID that's inside a main nav class that's inside a, you know, so shallow selectors is something that you have to try and, and have all of the time. You cannot have them all of the time, but I try to. Um, tied in with that is avoid having to rewrite properties. Um, so by that I mean try to define properties of which you know that they will be generic among, among objects. A very good example of this would be the, a, the anchor tag. Um, back in the days, I would define the color for the anchor tag. I would define the hover states and I would define the active states and everything, everything. Um, whether or not it would be underlined, you know, uh, if it would blink, talking uh, 19, uh, 1990 something. Um, so, and, but now we are used to styling uh, anchor tags like buttons. Um, and buttons don't have underlined texts and they're most of the time not colored. So if I would give my A tag on the tag level styling and I would then apply the button class to it, I'm essentially, I'm, I'm rewriting the properties of that button, which is a bit of a waste of rendering time, if you ask me. So um, um, I avoid having to rewrite the properties that I set in an earlier level, if I can. And again, it, it, it's not always possible, but I try. Um, avoiding context means that if you have uh, a search bar in your header, for example, um, and you're styling that search bar in a way because it's in the header, so your class names will start, your selectors will start with something like a header, a search, whatever, whatever, input element, um, and then you decide to move the search bar to your left or right sidebar. Problem, because now your your uh, uh, your <coughs> styling it's gone, because your styling was was tied to the context of the header bar. It's not good. It means it's not reusable. So not reusable means dry, because now I have to go and I write write another few uh, uh, declarations to give that thing styling in a different context. Uh, okay, specificity. 
Um, who knows about sp uh, specificity? Okay, so it would be a good thing to review. Good. Um, this is the order um, of least specificity in which the browser interprets styling that you may give it, that you tie to a specific uh, selector. The universal selector we all know, the star selector. Uh, we also know that we're not supposed to use it if we can, although there's a bit of a discussion about it because obviously, well, no, it's not a good idea to use it. Let's keep it at that. Um, that's the least specific. So any tag or any, any uh, uh, selector that you write after that will overwrite uh, anything that's put in the, uh, in the star selector. Um, sorry. Then the tag selectors, that one is the next in line. Those are the, the, the A, the div, the article, the HTML tags. Then come the class selectors. That's basically the styling hook that you're supposed to use when you're writing CSS. Uh, then we have the attribute sele uh, selectors, which I wouldn't recommend to use if, 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 if you don't have to, uh, because apparently they are slower to render for the browser. Uh, also, that depends on how many of them you're using, but it's, it's not as fast. Um, then you get the pseudo classes and the pseudo elements. Um, is the difference between the two familiar to you? Okay. Um, uh, a pseudo element is something um, that doesn't actually exist in the DOM, whereas a pseudo class is something that does exist in the DOM. So the first child that exists in the DOM, the first child of a, of, 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 of a list of, of, of allies in a UL tag, <coughs> uh, that exists in the DOM. And you reference that by a single colon, which many people don't know. Whereas the pseudo element that doesn't exist in the DOM because we're shooting it in there, a bit of content or an icon or something like that, uh, we reference that by a double column. Um, then the ID selectors. Um, those are used for JavaScript and for uh, putting anchors in your HTML and, and SVG. <coughs> yes, if you've been to Embrace the Vector uh, two days ago, exactly. Um, but try not to use them for, uh, uh, for style sheets, for, 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 for styling hooks, because they are more specific than the class selectors. So if you have something defined with a class, and then you define something in that main menu, it will override uh, anything in the class selector. It may or may not be what you intended uh, to do. Um, and then lastly, inline styles, <laughs> which you cannot do. Do not use inline styles, because inline styles, and, 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 and we all know there's many of those in, in, in Joomla, um, you, cannot <laughs> you cannot override them. So that's a pain in the hind for, for developers, for designers who, and front-end developers who have to, you know. Important. 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 Oh, yeah, of course. But you're not supposed to use important either. <laughs> <laughs> if you can. Uh, Okay, so but here are the bad habits. If you have good habits, ob obviously you've, you've got bad habits. So uh, overqualified selector dot menu dot main menu. Why? It's not really necessary. Dot menu probably suffices, and if not, then you have to relook at the way you structure your uh, your class names and, and your CSS. Um, overly specific selectors is also something that you have to look out for and try to avoid. Um, in the case of the, the the menu, unfortunately, we we need them. But um, if, you, if you don't have to use them, don't use them. Because again, we have to read from right to left. Uh, and it will slow the whole process of rendering your, your page down. Um, this, this is an example of the BEM notation. And we'll get to that. Yes? Yeah. Or whether the benefit of having clarity of your uh, 
policy is at the lab or SAC yeah. uh, uh, is you know, more important than this tiny bit that you might do referendum. That's a very good point. And yes, there are measurements of that. Um, because it, 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 it has been measured and it has been proven that, that it does cost a lot of more time. How much more time depends on the size of your style sheet and, and a lot of other factors. And then your, your, your argument that, that um, um, it makes your code clearer, basically, yeah. Yeah? Um, that can be solved. Then you can still have your shallow selectors, but you can still have some sort of a meaningful relationship in the, in the wording of your, uh, in the choice of your class names. Uh, and, and the meaning of, of, of uh, you know, the, the, uh, the behavior that it's probably going to have. So, and, and that's what BAM's all about, but, but, but you'll, you'll see that in a minute. Um, well, the universal selector, IDs for styling and important, bad habits. We cannot always go without them, so if you must use them, sure, use them. Uh, but if you don't have to use them, try to avoid them. Um, okay, some examples. Uh, this is um, something that I would have done not so long ago. Uh, this is an actual <laughs> example of something that exists. Um, we, we have, we have a, a button and, and we have some kind of a message container. And um, you would have defined a button uh, and, and with all of the aesthetics that go with that button. Um, and then you have your <coughs> message uh, container and, and, and that gets uh, some declarations to define what it will look like. Um, and we would call it in the, in the HTML by giving the class button and giving the class message. All is fine. Um, but if you have many more items that share similar uh, properties, uh, then obviously your style sheet will grow. This is our main issue with it. Um, and then if you have something that requires vendor prefixes like the border radius, then your CSS will grow even larger. Um, so this is something that um, we tried to fix. Uh, one approach might be, um, and again, this can all be done without any preprocessors, just plain CSS. Uh, uh, an, an, a solution to this would be to identify or abstract all the different behavioral elements and style them individually. Um, and then you can just string those along in your class names, anchor incognito, outline soft, um, if you want to combine these um, into aesthetics that is required by the designer. This is actually a very good approach for Joomla because now you can use all these individual classes inside the CMS, uh, uh, inside the editor, which can be handy. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of class names, which in my opinion is not a bad thing. Um, but some people oppose to it, they just don't like it. Preference, I suppose. Um, uh, yeah? <coughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Trade off? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure about the extra rendering time, that has not been measured as far as I know. I've, I've, I've tried to, to, to get data around that, but I haven't found any. Okay. Uh, so either nobody's interested in, in measuring that, or maybe there is no significant uh, uh, difference in time. Um, but as far as the size of your HTML is concerned, <coughs> if you have many of those classes uh, uh, in your document, uh, it becomes an excellent candidate for compression because it now has all these repeating terms that it'll just compress and, and <coughs> it wouldn't have any impact on the size of that. Um, but if you oppose that, uh, then for instance, SAS, and I'm sure Les has something similar, gives you the, the, the ability to uh, extend. Like in this example, we have all these, these different uh, um, uh, 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 classes defined in our style sheets um, and then we can just call these by extending anchor incognito <coughs> outline and soft into the button class. And then you'll end up with a similar uh, uh, organization, similar structure as the first uh, um, uh, version that I showed, except you would not be having double 
uh, uh, sets of vendor prefixes for the border radius because you'd be defining that only once. Um, and this would be the output uh, that would be generated by SAS in this instance if you follow uh, this example. Is this, does this make sense? Because I don't think we have time to really go into the deep. Uh yeah, so SAS will also have these kinds of things. Yeah. You have mixins that will duplicate it more. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. Because if you use mixins, you end up with the same big style sheet. Yeah. Uh, but this causes only for, for the button class to be added to, uh, to the other uh, already existing uh, um, uh, classes. And it, it may not look like, a, like a, an improvement uh, in size here, but if you have many more elements sharing these same properties, then it will be an improvement. Um, okay, abstracting behavior means that you have to abstract your class names. And to me, that's the single most difficult um, uh, uh, element of writing style sheets. Because I keep searching for class names that are um, generic enough to be able to be applied across different uh, output modules, uh, but still convey enough meaning so that developers can understand what it will most likely be doing. Um, and, and that's a bit of, th that's, that's, that's not easy to do. Um, do you remember Foundation? And I think even Bootstrap 2, the first versions, uh, where you had a red button and a green button and a, and, a, and a blue button and a yellow button. Okay, and they had those class names, blue button, yellow button. Okay, so and if you then went to, uh, to customize it a little, bit, a little bit because you didn't want to have blue buttons, you wanted to have purple buttons and you didn't want to have yellow buttons, but you wanted to have orange buttons then you're stuck with something that's called a blue button, but it's not blue, it's purple. So those names weren't good, but they quickly realized that, and then they came up with, uh, with names like uh, warning button and, and uh, success button and, and, and what have you. So that would be a very good example of, of, of abstracting those, those class names so that they can be reused for different things. Um, so basically, you're, you're trying not to tie in the context to your class name. That's, that's what, you, what you want from your class names. Um, and um, what we must remember also, my, my notes, now I can read them, so I want to share them with you. Um, uh, it's, it's important for the class names to have meaning to us as developers and, and, and not to the machines. The machines don't care. You can call it class one to 1,000 if you want to. It doesn't care, but we care. Um, and that brings us to BEM, and that will answer Marco's question. Uh, BEM is uh, the abbreviation for Block Element Modifier, and it was developed by Yandex, uh, which is like the Russian, Russian. Google. Yeah. Um, BEM is a little bit more than just a naming methodology because it's also uh, JavaScript, and uh, uh, they're building pages at runtime, pulling in the CSS files as they need them. Um, and they use this, this system where they identify every piece of HTML, every piece of markup as a, as, as a block, as they call it. Um, and uh, then uh, they would organize that in a file structure where they would have, uh, uh, I don't know, the markup, uh, the CSS, and maybe some JavaScript. They would all be called the same, so you would have block HTML, block.js, and block.css. Uh, and then when they build their pages, they just, they just pull in these blocks and then they render it. Um, excuse me. So, um, what have they done? They are uh, sort of namespacing each block on the top level. For instance, this would be, that, that little drawing there is a search box. <laughs> okay, it's not a bang upside down, it's a search box. Um, so the top level would be search, <laughs> and then this particular block would have two elements, two child elements, search underscore underscore input and search underscore underscore button. So they separate um, uh, the, the, the block from the child by two underscores. Um, ugly, right? No? When I first saw it, I thought, wow, that's ugly. Um, and then you have the modifier, and that's the interesting bit. Uh, search dash dash Google, 
so for instance, search dash dash Google might render uh, the Google logo uh, in the background of the search box to indicate that uh, the search is not searching within the website's content, but it's searching on, on the, Google, uh, the Google search uh, engine, maybe. I don't know, it's just an example. Um, and then you'd call it by giving it class search and then search dash dash Google. And you could also just have the class search and then you wouldn't have the Google logo in it. Um, this makes everything very uh, modular and ve very reusable, thus giving you very dry style sheets. Um, and you'll get used to the syntax, I promise. So the point behind the syntax is to provide context directly uh, into the selector. Um, and now everybody knows not only what this piece of CSS code is about, <coughs> because apparently it's about styling a search uh, block, uh, but they also will know where to search it, because the naming convention also states that um, every styling regarding that block will be contained in a single file, so the developer knows exactly where to go and find the styling for that thing and, and, and uh, uh, change it if it, if it must. Um, well, this is a bit more elaborative on, on the whole system. So this would be the block, the independent entity that can be moved around on your page. And preferably, while you're moving, you want it to behave the same way in that you want it to look the same wherever it goes, unless you don't, in which case you use the modifiers. Um, blocks can contain ch child elements, but they can also contain other blocks. So you can have a header block that contains the search block and that contains a navigation block and blah, 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 so on. Uh, then the element, that's the smallest part of a block. Um, and it's context dependent because it's inside the search. And it will have uh, search underscore underscore input as a class name, for example. Um, whereas the block is context independent. That's very important. And we can give them slightly alternating properties by giving it a modifier class. And now, Back to your question, by using this annotation, you can still convey meaning through your class names. Remember Marco was asking, but okay, you know, if you, if you have descendant selectors like search and then dot input, and the old way we were doing it, you would have context, and that context is useful for the developer to know what it is and what it does, but you don't actually need it. Um, I'll give some more examples. I don't know, how are we on time? No, are we? No, we're okay. Yeah. Having one search thing and not repeating the word search in your message information and still end up with this concatenated selector. Uh, okay, I'm not familiar with less, so I don't know how you would do it in that, but yeah, I'll show you how to do it in SAS in a minute. Maybe it's the same. Um, okay, and modifiers can be written for the root block, so for the search uh, selector, but it can also. Uh, be written for any of the child elements. Um, and, and also, we, we, we try to, to not, you don't have children of children. Okay, if, if there's something inside, for instance, a form uh, that would have uh, this uh, search and then it has a field set, and that's a child of the form, but it's not a child, it, and it's also a child of the, of the, of the, uh, the class of the block in, in CSS terms. And then the input element that's inside the form, inside the field set, uh, that's a child in terms of markup, but it's not a, ch not, not a child of, I have to say it differently, it's not a child, it's a child of the field set, which is a child of the form, but in the CSS, it's not a child of the field set, it's only a child of the, the, the top level block. So basically, you only have one generation of children, does that make sense? Mm, yes. <laughs> Silly. Um, because otherwise, it will become even more ugly, uglier. So this is basically all there is to it. You have a block and a block underscore underscore element and block dash dash modifier or a block underscore underscore element dash dash modifier. That's also perfectly fine. Uh, any questions so far? Good, you've made it to an important bit. Um, we use double dashes and double underscores because then we are able to, to have um, uh, element or block identifiers like main dash navigation or top dash search or something like that. 
And if we were to have just a single dash between the modifier and the, and the, and the block name, uh, then we lose the clarity. So that's why it looks like that. Okay, so the, the media object we encountered earlier. Um, so, so far uh, we know that, that we try to avoid uh, uh, not shallow selectors, so we want shallow selectors, and obviously here there's two selectors that are, are not completely shallow and that they are two levels deep, the media image and a media image extended. Okay. Um, and BAM allows us to bring that back to uh, a more shallow notation. Media underscore underscore image and media underscore underscore image dash dash uh, uh, reversed. Uh, unfortunately, this typeface uh, kind of strings the two dashes along, so it looks like one very large dash. Okay. Um, okay. So another example, the person object, and this will show you why um, this notation is so very useful. Uh, we have a person, and the person has an eye. We have female people, and we have uh, uh, girls have different eyes, uh, and we have a left eye, and we have a right eye. And just by looking at eye, we don't know which eye. Uh, by looking at person, we don't know whether it's female or whether it's male. We don't know. But by using the BEM notation, we can convey more meaning uh, to all of these elements that we're styling, uh, because now we can see it's a person eye and an animal eye, we see that the person is female, and then we have a female eye. And we have a left eye, and we have a right eye. And um, who, who was in the uh, Embrace the Vector presentation? Only two of you? Oh, that's a shame. It was so nice. OK, right. This is an example from their presentation. This here is Marco. Marco. <laughs> the other person is Chiara, who we all know and love. And, uh, they had a presentation on, uh, um, on SVG output and how they were uh, uh, using class names to identify uh, um, elements within the SVG that could then be styled to, uh, through SVG. But they had one issue. Um, both uh, uh, Marco as well as Chiara had a nose, but both of them had the class name or the ID, I think it is, nose. Yeah. And so by CSS, you had no means of identifying and styling that object unless you went down the DOM tree, DOM tree to, to find it. Um, but with BAM, you could have done it like this. <coughs> and in your case, like that. Yeah, but the challenge uh, in that case is that uh, that DOM tree was generated by Illustrator, and then you have this control of what the top levels were. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But if you restyle it like that, yeah, absolutely yeah, true. this would help. When I was looking at your presentation, I realized immediately, okay, this would be really yeah. helpful in solving that particular problem. Yeah. yeah. But that would require handwork afterwards. Well, so Chiara needed to name the layers anyway, so she no, could have named them that. No, but that wouldn't solve the problem. Okay, we can. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it. Um, okay, um, classicitis is something we uh, we are all scared of. Um, you said it? Oh, you said it, yeah. Um, but again, it, it's not so very bad because uh, all these classes that are repeated throughout your, uh, uh, your document, you can just compress them, compress your pages and problem solved. Um, yeah, so that all of that up until now, except for the extend example, was stuff that we could do with CSS. Right now, you don't have to use a preprocessor to, to, to implement these techniques, and they will already help you. But um, we do have preprocessors, uh, and we are very uh, grateful about that. Uh, I myself uh, am a, a SAS user, uh, but you can use less or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, 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 preprocessors give us a lot of tools that enable us to further optimize um, um, our, our workflow and, and also our style sheets. Uh, I missed the magic word extend, because mission don't do what you want in the web site. No, but extend is inheritance. And actually, this the reason is it's, it's, it's these terms is because uh, this is I've, I've done this presentation before in the Netherlands, and I was making the, con the, 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 the comparison to object-oriented programming. Um, and CSS in itself, it doesn't have any object-oriented uh, features. Uh, but when you start using preprocessors, all of a sudden you do have 
uh, 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 some of those features. And inheritance is one of them, because the extent thing is nothing more than some element inheriting the styles, you know, f something else. Um, and, and we have variables, so we, we can declare a color. Uh, we have functions, so we can declare uh, snazzy little uh, calculations. Uh, we have mix-ins and placeholders. Do, I, do you have placeholders in less? Okay. Not if you want. Okay. If you if you want to know about those, then just come find me after because it would take too long to explain all of them. Inheritance we've already seen. Operators and directives like for loops and if and blah. Uh, and maps, which is very new. Which it, it only was introduced in in the recent release, 3.3. And maps basically gives us uh, kind of like associative arrays, uh, and you can do some really interesting stuff with that. Uh, and another ability of preprocessors, regardless which one you use, <laughs> and this is by uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, or actually it's by Hugo Giraudel, which is a French guy, uh, and he does very clever things with, with SAS, and if you're interested, you should probably follow him. Um, uh, if, if you were writing CSS before, you had a few options to organize your style sheets. Um, uh, yes, you could split your style sheet up in smaller style sheets, uh, but that would give you additional HTTP requests. It would give you smaller code per, per style sheet, but it gave you access to HTTP requests, and we don't like HTTP requests. Um, um, and you can try to find some organization within your document that's very difficult to maintain because everything, uh, every time you either remove something or add something, you've got to update uh, the index at the top of the page and you have to scroll through thousands of lines of code to find the one piece that you want to, uh, to change. Um, so all of that was, was, was rather pain, painful. Um, but with preprocessors, you, you, you can cut up your, your, uh, your style sheets uh, in something... Huh? In, as many. in as many pieces as you want, although it will affect the compile time, the compilation time of your style sheets, so if you, right. that can become okay. a bit of a nuisance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, SAS calls these files partials. Uh, and a partial is identified by an underscore preceding the file name and then the extension of .sas or .scss, whichever you prefer. There are two notations. They do the same, but, th but they, they are slightly different. And scss looks like css, so I prefer to use that one. Um, and you can just cut those up into different directories. And so now all of a sudden it becomes really easy to find something. And if you remember uh, the BAM notation and the blocks, uh, what you would do is you would have in your blocks folder, and, and this is um, uh, the structure I'm currently using, but I've, I've it's, it's, an, it's a process of iteration. I've, I've tried different setups, and it, this, this may change, or, or it may be exactly what I need, I don't know. Uh, but for each block that you define, you would have one file inside that blocks folder. And if someone comes along and wants to help you on your, on your project, um, they would immediately know where everything is located and can just go in, change it, and, and then all of these partial files will be pulled in to one giant uh, uh, style sheet. Well, not so giant, hopefully, if you're doing everything right, but uh, a larger one than the individual uh, items, um, and you have your style sheet. And you can also reuse these partials. For instance, if you have a progressive website, uh, and you've defined your styles for, for the mobile view and for the desktop view and for whatever other views you, you want to define, um, and you still have to support Microsoft Explorer 8 or below, you can, uh, I mean, for your responsive uh, website, you would have those style declarations inside a, a media uh, query, probably. Um, but Microsoft Explorer 8 and, be and below, they, c they can't read the media queries. Uh, but you can create another style sheet and pull in just those Microsoft, uh, uh, or just the, the desktop code and have a separate Microsoft Explorer 8 and below style sheet that has all the desktop code but not encapsulated in the media query tags, which is really useful. Uh, same goes for like theme uh, variations. Or for instance, recently uh, I did a governmental site and, and they needed to be able to enlarge uh, the font size, and they needed to have like a different uh, contrast uh, uh, rendering, dark background, light text. Uh, so I would pull in all the elements from the normal style sheet, uh, and then add some overrides to colors and stuff like that, and boom, done. Took me less than 10 minutes to create four different theme overrides based on what I already had. 
which is a huge uh, time saver. Um, right. Um, remember J layout? Roberto gave a nice presentation. Is he here? Okay. Well, um, basically, J layout, each layout file that you would have is essentially a block. It's more or less what it is. We call it differently, but it's a block. And so I'm thinking that maybe in some future, um, if we could, for instance, uh, uh, compile at runtime or something, uh, we could have the CSS and the JavaScript inside the blast. See, do, oh yeah, yay! <laughs> so that would be really good if we could somehow have that. That would make life so much easier because now you have everything in one place and you just pull it in as you need it and, and life will be happy. Um, okay, I promised you a few notations to help with BAM in SAS. This is how you would do it in SAS. You would declare a block. Um, you would use the ampersand. Well, it's the and same hmm? It's the same unless. Okay, great. And, and that code there is very easy for us to parse as humans. It's an ampersand, but it's, a, it's just my snazzy typeface. Uh, <laughs> that makes it look a little bit weird. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks a little bit funny. It looks a little bit like a bird. You could just, um, but it's an ampersand, and uh, it produces that output. Um, but if you, because if you're using pre preprocessors, you can nest your your uh, um, your selectors, which makes your code really organized. And and you don't want to lose that because you're now all of a sudden using shallow selectors, and you don't have to. You can still. Uh, uh, organize your, your, your CSS declarations like you're used to, all nested and everything, but it will produce shallow selectors because it knows to put them uh, at the root of that block element. Uh, there's another way to do it, which is called um, uh, at root. does the exact same thing. It's just a bit more verbose. Is that a word? Okay. Um, so those two things, they do the exact same thing. Um, we're pretty much through uh, the whole thing. We have time. Uh, okay. Questions? Questions? Oh, five minutes. I thought you had a question. Um, I thought it would be fun to, uh, because like I said, naming stuff is, is for me the most difficult thing f in CSS, in writing CSS code. Um, we never got this far in Holland, so good for you. Either you're so tired or whatever. Um, but um, I thought it would be fun to, to, um, to look at a, at, at, at a uh, um, page design, web page design, and see if we can identify um, those elements of the page that can be reused and it should probably be abstracted out into their own particular blocks and, and, and styling. Um, this, is a, this, is, this is an old web design. I, I did it, it's, it was never built. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of a nice candidate for this particular exercise because it has a lot of elements that kind of look alike but are different. So, um, does anybody want to give it a go? <coughs> no? Start yeah? Yeah. Yeah, the menu. Yeah, the menu. Um, what about these things right here with the lines under them? Yeah, list items, but this is probably a menu. And, and this is something else. This is a, a brickboard. It's a brickboard. It's, it's, um, what's brickboard in English? Yeah. A pegboard, Brick. yeah. Something that you stick stuff on and yeah. Yeah, on your refrigerator or, yeah, okay, cool. Um, which, is, which is, I mean, it's a different type of, of uh, uh, block or module or whatever, and it'll have different markup from, from the list. But it shares uh, uh, properties because it also has this gray underline, uh, just like the, 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 the menu. And then this, this, this little piece here, same thing, has the lines under them. Um, and so you would probably only need to, to have, I don't know, something like 20 declarations uh, in order to build this entire page. Uh, th by declaration, I mean a set of of style properties, not just a single one, but something that has a class and then has some properties defined to it. Um, and, and then you, I mean, for this particular website, you would probably already have half of the code to build everything. 
which is a huge improvement to what you would be doing before because you would be defining uh, the header for the pegboard yeah? and then the styling for the elements inside it and then you'd move on to the menu and you would define a header again maybe or if you were clever you wouldn't be doing that but and then you'll define those list elements and they'll all have border declarations in them and then you'll do the same for I don't know for all these other elements and all of a sudden you have a big style sheet and you've done a lot of work for nothing um, so um, I hope that sort of explains uh, what the intended outcome of, of this entire exercise of modularizing and abstracting uh, your code, uh, wh what the intended outcome is, which is lean style sheets with reusable objects that you can apply uh, um, to different elements because you've class named them in such a way that you can, because it would feel awkward um, uh, to, to give this thing uh, something like a profile header class name because it's not a profile header. Yeah. It was a profile header there or whatever header, but it's not here. So you need to give it a more generic name so that you can reuse it on different components. Questions? Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Again? You're welcome. So uh, it's, it's over on slide deck, or is it slide deck? No, what's it called? Uh, speaker deck, sorry, speaker deck. Uh, um, and, and there's, I mean, this list of, of resources, uh, there's some pretty neat.